Welcome, I'm Harald Sack. And I'm Antan. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number six, Intelligent Applications with Knowledge Graphs and Deep Learning. So we are going to start this lecture with a look into the graph within the Knowledge Graph. Let's first recap the definition of a Knowledge Graph. So we did this already in the very first week of the lecture. So, and what is a Knowledge Graph? A Knowledge Graph mainly describes real-world entities and their interrelations organized in a graph. So that's the thing we will be talking about next. And it defines possible classes and relations of entities in a schema. So we saw that when we were defining ontologies and all the stuff. And allows for potentially interrelating arbitrary entities with each other, of course within a graph. And covers various topical domains. So far so good. Anyhow, so there are more, let's say, flexible definitions of knowledge graphs and we try to widen it a bit up so that it's a graph consisting of concepts, classes, properties, relationships and entity descriptions. It's based usually on formal knowledge representation languages like RDFS and OL. And the data that is then available in the knowledge graph, of course, can be differently or at a different degree, open or not. So it's completely open, for example, for publicly available knowledge graphs in DBpedia or in Wikidata. It can also be private, let's say, the uh, supply chain data from a company, or it can be simply closed, like for example, product models and stuff like that. On the other hand, so if you look at uh, the creation of that, it can be original data, it can be derived data, it can be aggregated data, and we distinguish usually instance data as kind of ground truth that we see there, schema data that are the vocabularies and the ontologies, and we have additional metadata that gives us an idea about the provenance, the version and the license information of the data we are looking at. What you are used to categorize these entities are then taxonomies, so mm -hmm. we have classes that build class hierarchies and usually then you have links between internal and external data. data. And this of course includes mapping so to the data stored in other systems and databases. And as we have also heard last week of course, all of the data in a knowledge graph usually is fully compliant with the fair data principles, or it should be fully compliant with the fair data principles, simply by design. Because of many of the fair principles and the requirements to fulfill them, we already take care for, for example, like in the linked open data principles. Okay, but now let's go deeper into the theory and we first look into the graph within the knowledge graph. Yes, so a knowledge graph as defined is a knowledge base that is a graph. So here we are talking about a simple directed graph G with the tuple V for the vertices and E for the edges. So the V or the vertices has a size N while the E or the directed edges is a Cartesian product between the set of our vertices where each edge is a tuple, tuple V sub K which is the head or the subject, and V sub L, which is the object or the tail. And E, it is important to note, is an ordered pair. Therefore, we cannot interchange V sub K or V sub L with each other. Yes, simply because it's a directed graph. Yes. So now, let's define the different types of graphs. We have a graph with self-loops. This means that the graph is extended to have edges where it relates the same vertex. Or in other words, we have vertices with a, an edge that goes back to itself. And then we have a multigraph. In a multigraph, we have multiple edges with the same subject and object pair. So this means that we have parallel edges. And lastly, we have edge labeled graph. In an edge labeled graph, we have an additional labeling function, lambda. So the edge will have labels, or in other words, the label maps each edge in E to an element set in a set of labels L. Similarly for vertex labeled graphs. So your edges here will have additional description which are the labels. True. Okay, let's continue and I will switch on the laser pointer for sake of visualization. So now, an edge is said to be incidental 
to the vertex to the vertices it connects. So if you know you have an edge that falls into another edge uh, into another node, then of course the edge is incidental to exactly that kind of vertex. Another thing we have to learn is the degree. So the, the degree of a vertex simply is the number of edges that are incidental to it. And in a directed graph, so if you have a direction like we just said, you have to distinguish between incoming edges and outgoing edges, considering a, a vertex. And therefore in a directed graph the in degree of a vertex is the number of edges pointing towards the vertex. And analogous, analogously, you define the out degree. Furthermore, if we continue, so if you go one edge, then following another edge and another edge, you end up in a called so-called path. So, and a directed path, of course, in a directed graph is a sequence of consecutive edges. So, for example, E sub one, E sub two, until E sub n, where each edge following on each other. So we have edge. EI, for example, that starts at vertex VI or VL and leads to vertex VK and then the subsequent edge then would start also at VK and lead to another node VM. That's a directed path. And in a directed graph, so a graph with directed edges, we call that strongly connected. So we are now up here. It's strongly connected if there is a direct path from any vertex to every other vertex. So there are no islands that are shut up or shut out of the graph. So this is then a strongly connected graph. Okay, so let's say we have a problem to solve and we want to use a knowledge graph. But how can we tell which graph to use? For example, do we use knowledge graph A or knowledge graph B? So it's not so simple and straightforward, but we have some guidelines. We can compare knowledge graphs depending on its size, its coverage, completeness, level of detail, accuracy, and of course, most importantly, reliability. And the idea here is we compare the graphs structurally. And by that, we look at network analysis. So network analysis is a long introduced methodology. So what you are doing there, it has been developed for finding, for example, the most important vertices in a graph. This is very interesting in network. You have usually flow, uh, things that flow through the network and specific hubs you have there are really important. Simply, for example, if you think of a, of a network of water pipes, then it's important, for example, that if at no crossing or cross point, which would be then the, the interconnected nodes, that mm -hmm. there, uh, uh, let's say, the load or, or uh, the capacity is overloaded. For that reason, for example, it's really important to find out which are the so-called most important vertices in a graph, and this has a long tradition. Vertex Im importance is based on the structure of the graph, such as one thing which is called the graph centrality. But now let's look at it. what makes a node important. Yes, so what makes a node important? Let's look at network analysis first. Okay, here we describe a flow. A flow is something such as goods in a, for example, a logistics network or information in a social media network or even water as your analogy. Okay, I a node is said to be important if there is a lot of flows coming from it, like in a supply chain. So if there are a lot of good goods coming from a specific warehouse, this warehouse is very important. Or a lot of flow going into it in a network of links or in a in the present um, circumstances, you would say in a social network, when there are a lot of people following a certain account, then this account is very important. Or going through it, like in a communication network. So a flow might be modeled by weighted paths, possibly factoring in not only the length, but the number of paths to it. So paths might be important if they pass through important nodes. And lastly, in a knowledge graph, the importance of edges and nodes may also depend on other features such as edge or vertex labels. So 
let's find out about important notes on a practical example. So we have a huge knowledge base, Wikidata, and we, of course we know Sparkle. And a Wikidata entity, which is a note, might be important if it is referenced by many Wikipedia pages. So we could find out, for example, who is the most important science fiction author by simply going through all of the authors and looking how many Wikipedia pages are referencing to it. And uh, you could do this here with a simple query if you have a look at it. So we are looking here for author should be, I guess, this is a science fiction writer. And this is a new thing here. This Wikibase site links gives us the possibility to count the number of links here and to sum them up in the end. So to find out what's the number of links for a specific page and then we find out, okay, here from a specific page uh, there, there might be, I don't know, X number of, uh, of, of uh, links that drive in there. And of course we are also interested in the author label here because we want to know who is the author and who is the most important science fiction author and all of that will be grouped by the name of the author and then it will be ordered by its importance which is here computed as the sum of all of the links and this is then ordered in descending order. So on the next page we have the possibility to do this query live. So let's try. So here is the query. I do it live. This takes a while because we have to aggregate many of them and here you see, ah, okay, interesting to see here with three, uh, 236 the leading or most important Skyfi author qualifies here Mark Twain. You might not know Mark Twain as a science fiction author, but of course uh, you might know um, a Yankee uh, at the court of uh, King Arthur, a Yankee from Connecticut at the court of King Arthur. So I that was a, uh, it's a time travel, uh, funny time travel story by Mark Twain. So he qualifies as a science fiction writer. Okay. Or Voltaire, Bertrand Russell, Rudyard Kipling and so on. So many names that you probably, oh, he's also Isaac Asimov. Okay. But of course there are many more more important authors because, yeah, Wikipedia says so and links so. Okay, but let's go back to our presentation. Okay, another way to find out whether a node is important is to look at degree centrality. So a s degree centrality restricts to incoming and going paths of length one. We say that an in-degree centrality of a directed graph is given by its in-degree, while in an undirected graph the out-degree centrality and the degree centrality are one and the same. Mm. So there are more sophisticated forms of centrality measures. So for example, we have eigenvector centrality, cat's centrality, or page rank which was proposed by Google. So there are many more uh, measures of centrality. Exactly. So further measures, measures to characterize the knowledge graph are, of course, then for example, sizes. So you look at the knowledge graph, count the number of nodes, and this can be, of course, immediately compared to another knowledge graph and to say this one is larger, this one is smaller. You can count not only nodes, you can count the number of facts of triples you have there. And of course, it's also interesting to see how much information, how many facts are there per entity. So you mm -hmm. take the average number of facts per node. So this then clearly tells you which one might be more explicit mm -hmm. in that sense. Another interesting uh, measure is then the knowledge graph diameter. So what's that? So we have to first look at the eccentricity. The eccentricity of a node is the maximum distance between a certain node and any other node. So what's the maximum distance that you can cover from one node to another? And um, the diameter of a graph then is the maximum eccentricity of a graph. This means the greatest distance between any pair of nodes. Mm -hmm. That's the maximum diameter. This means also you need this number of hops most uh, to really come from one end to the other, which means to cover the entire width of the, of the graph. Mm -hmm. And to find the diameter of the graph, first we have to find the shortest path between each pair of nodes. And then the greatest length of any of these parts is the diameter of the graph. Okay. And you see that's a complicated procedure that might take some while, especially if mm -hmm. you have a large knowledge graph, let's say with billions of facts. Plus, how do you compute for the diameter when your graph is not strongly connected? Yeah, 
Then of course you have several diameters, you could make an average, so there are several possibilities. Mm. Yes, so you can approximate. Yeah, so another thing besides the diameter, there's also the radius, what's that? The radius of a graph, again, is then the minimum eccentricity of a graph, which means the shortest uh, of the maximum distances between any pair of nodes. So you look at all of the uh, uh, eccentricities that you have computed and then you take the minimum of it. So radius is the minimum, diameter is the maximum. If we continue, we could also then look simply at the in and out degree and we can determine what's the average in degree, what's the average out degree, what's the average path length in a node, in a graph and many more. So there are many different kind mm. of statistical measures which give us information about the importance of single nodes, for example, and also about the structure of the knowledge graph. Okay, but in knowledge graphs, importance of nodes might further depend on other things. For example, it might depend on the edge attributes. The or properties. It, yes, the properties. Or it might depend on the node labels or further attributes of nodes. So for example, here, specific nodes or edges might be ignored. In the case of um, OWL, all entities in OWL are referred to or are instances of OWL thing. So mm -hmm. then if you consider OWL thing uh, to be, uh, you can't consider OWL thing to be the most important nodes despite the fact that a lot of entities are referring to it because it's superfluous. It's like a super, super class in OWL. So therefore we might ignore this fact if we want to determine the importance of nodes. Exactly, because mm -hmm. otherwise our thing always would be the most important yeah. node and this gives us no information at all. Yes, because all of the entities are our thing anyway. So, um, as you can see, yes, we can find out the importance of a node using network analysis techniques, but this is very computationally very complex and we can also use embeddings to approximate these things. And because knowledge graph embeddings were spurred on or influenced by the developments in NLP, the next excursion will be about distributional semantics and language models.